Sometimes when I tell people I'm pansexual, they'll be like, oh, what, so you have sex with pans? And I'm like, no, that's, uh, that's actually really ignorant. Uh, the truth is I have sex with most kitchenware. Like, like, don't leave me alone in the room with your slow cooker, okay? Because she won't be able to resist this. So I've been thinking a lot lately about man-hating and feminism, misandry, whatever you want to call it. Just have been kind of sorting out my personal feelings on the topic. And I have talked about misandry before in other videos, specifically how it can be understood often as the anger that women and other gender oppressed people feel in reaction to their personal experiences with misogyny. And as I've said, that anger can be understandable. Oppression of any kind is very traumatizing. It certainly leaves people feeling all different kinds of ways towards their oppressors. And it can be very validating to articulate that anger and have it be heard. Especially since the oppressed, women especially, are often discouraged from voicing their feelings about the very upsetting things that they experience. Audrey Lord talks about that dismissal of anger in the context of women of color who are responding to racism. She also explains how that reactive anger can have its uses, specifically as a way to motivate ourselves to fight for change. But what I've been thinking about lately is what happens when that anger isn't properly addressed or deconstructed or reoriented into action, because I've personally found that uncritical approaches to anger can let that misandry teeter into actual hatred and apathy. And those two things are way, way less productive than anger. The opposite, in fact, because they can lead you in a totally different direction. Most often a direction towards anti-intersectionality and transmisogyny. Because, like, if you're really dedicated to the hating all men approach, that has to be hinged on a view that sees all men as always the oppressors and all women as always the victims. Which, of course, goes against the intersectional framework that asks us to question those kind of dichotomies. And if you're a white feminist especially, that lack of intersectional thinking can make us ignorant to the ways in which our distrust and anger can end up actually hurting men of color. And as for the transmisogyny, again, I've talked about this before, but TERFs love misandry. They'll target new, young feminists who have a lot of anger towards men and try to turn that anger into blanket hatred towards maleness. Or, in a more roundabout way, hatred towards all those who were socialized male. That hatred is, of course, also applied to trans women who TERFs have categorized as socialized male alongside cis men. And I'd also argue that that anger leads to some very carceral politics as well, since feelings of contempt and apathy go very nicely with retributive forms of justice. And call me a hippie, but there's something to be said about the truly transformative and revolutionary nature of love. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that hatred towards men, misandry, can be useful and relatively harmless until it's not. And unfortunately, many feminists do let their misandry go unchecked. So that's why I tend to stay away from the I hate all men, kill all men type of vibes. I've just personally found that focusing my feelings on hating men does not serve my personal journey or my feminist politic at all. And my experiences with the man-hating feminist communities, Tumblr radfems namely, have not been good. Hi, Benji here, and this is why gender equality doesn't have to affect you to matter. You don't have to have a wife, girlfriend, mum, daughter, or sister. You don't have to know that deconstructing gender stereotypes also deconstructs toxic masculinity, allowing men the freedom to be themselves. All well, that's removing gender divisions makes society more inclusive for all gender identities and gender expression. All well, that's women have always played integral roles in all social movements, meaning we all benefit from affirming and uplifting their voices. Because gender equality is a human right. And it should be enough to just believe that gender shouldn't be a barrier to opportunity, success, safety, or happiness. And that we all have a duty to be agents for positive change and to hold those around us accountable for prejudiced beliefs and discriminatory behavior. Gender equality doesn't have to affect you to matter. It just does. Take care. Bye. Men speak 7,000 words a day and women speak 20,000. I've heard three people say this in the last few weeks and they all say it so offhandedly as if it's a universally known fact. So I'm going to say this again. It's bullshit. Made up to make women be quiet when their husbands get home from work. The earliest known instance of this fact is from a 1993 book by James Dobbs and a conservative evangelical psychologist. And like I said last time I talked about this, you've probably gone years without hearing that name. I'm sorry for breaking the streak. Dobson was like, women speak 50,000 words a day and men speak 25,000 and then everyone just ran with it. There are three simple ways to tell that this is entirely fictitious. One, actual studies. Every time this has been tracked, the results are unsurprising. Men and women speak on average the same amount. Two, the numbers people fill in the stat with vary wildly. Sometimes it's 50,000 and 25,000. Sometimes it's 4,000 and 2,000. This variance does not lend credibility to the idea. Third, I'm going to say a word and you describe who you picture when I say it. Windbag. Are you picturing a woman or are you picturing a dude? Probably a dude at a county fair trying to pitch you a kitchen remodel. I think I know the answer, but I'm not going to speak for you. We'll let your comments be the judge. 50,000 words. Oh my God. This mentality is so frustrating because men of color perfectly understand what institutional oppression is because y'all understand racism, but you refuse to extend that level of understanding to sexism because it doesn't affect you.
right? You can wrap your heads around white supremacy, but refuse to acknowledge the patriarchy. You can make the argument for why Black Lives Matter is called Black Lives Matter and not All Lives Matter, yet you question white feminism is called feminism and not humanism. And you're perfectly able to understand what white privilege is. And you know that someone can have so many disadvantages, be up against so much, but if they are white, at least one of those disadvantages isn't racism. And yet you don't extend that to male privilege. At this point, you're picking and choosing, and it's the selective reasoning for me. And by the way, um, I have a question, and don't fight me because I know how you girls like to tussle. You don't end your sexualization when you stop being sexual. Women aren't sexualized for being sexual. They are sexualized for being. So stop apologizing for being sexual in a world that has yet to apologize for sexualizing your existence. Tell me how's it feel? Tell me how's it feel? Did you ever think the media portrays you that way because that's how a lot of yins behave? I mean, don't get me wrong, a year ago we watched a cop kneel on a man's neck for nine fucking minutes while all of his cop buddies sat around and watched him murder a man. And before you bad apples me, remember the phrase is, one bad apple spoils the bunch. Also, isn't there some sort of statistic about police and domestic violence? Oh yeah, so it's kind of fucking weird that you would be swinging at a mirror and then your wife catches you. If most of you were in law enforcement to make a difference, black people wouldn't be afraid of you. Women would feel comfortable disclosing sexual assault. No one would think twice about calling you whenever they need help. But you're not here to make a difference. You're here to be hero worshipped, and that video proves it. If you think bad media attention is as serious as worrying about your kids being shot by the police for carrying a pack of Skittles, you're fucking delusional. Radical feminism is one of the big three schools of feminist thought, and its goal is to as abolish the patriarchy instead of assimilating into it like liberal feminism does. Central issues that rad femmes target include breaking down traditional gender roles, um, critiquing institutions rooted in patriarchal power, and understanding the role that prostitution under the patriarchy plays in the oppression of women. Unfortunately, radical feminism is associated with TERFs. A lot of rad femmes adopt bioessentialist and reductionist beliefs, which are inherently transphobic, and this trans-exclusionary radical feminism is harmful to trans women and misogyny-affected individuals as it invalidates their identity. And rad fem is a form of feminism that views the patriarchy as the main form of inequality in society, but this kind of overlooks class and race, it overlooks intersectionality. And due to the lack of intersectionality within the radical feminism movement and the transphobic rhetoric and beliefs that are a part of it, I'm definitely reluctant to identify myself as a rad femme. And again, feminism should be inclusive to trans people and women of color. It should be inclusive and intersectional. My fellow white women are disappointing. Instead of doing any research or organizing, you made merch. Spent a whole lot of time complaining that black, brown, and other non-white women or female assumed individuals are sick of doing all of the work for white women to get all the rewards. How convenient, how convenient when our white uh, bodily autonomy is under threat, it suddenly becomes a fight for all women. But when it comes time to speak up and speak out about murdered and missing indigenous women, oh, that suddenly becomes an indigenous problem, not a woman's problem. When it comes time to speak up and speak out about the horrendous treatment of immigrant women at the border, oh, suddenly it becomes a them problem, not a woman's problem. When it comes time to speak about the lack of bodily autonomy disabled people have, oh, well, well, suddenly that's not a woman's problem. That's a disabled people problem. Somehow my fellow white women don't understand why black, brown, other non-white women and disabled women don't trust us. A part in the book where she describes what a lot of conventionally attractive or thin people might be able to experience that she doesn't get to. And that is- a I have never had my feelings about my experience as a black fat female articulated so beautifully so thank you for sharing that i really need to read that book apparently um but i'm truly just mind blown because i don't think people understand how othered it is to be the fat friend <laughs> like and you know people are well intentioned and they say things like oh girl you can borrow that dress or oh girl like go talk to that guy he's totally into you but not having the context of like hey i'm fat and also like 
hey, I'm black. Like, I'm black as fuck. Like, my life is not the same as yours. And, like, we cannot compare the two. And they literally saw her as an object. Like, people are like, oh, you objectify women. Actually, they're hi. My name is Mercury. I'm the trans maintenance lady. First off, that's an amazing video. And I want you to go take a look at it and really hear it. I think hearing her voice is really important. And I don't want to take away from that. But there's something also that's really important. And... I've been looking for videos that can demonstrate that. And this is the smoke detector beeping in the background. A lot of people don't know where these come from. Like, why is that happening? I don't understand. Is it broken? It's actually trying to alert you to the batteries inside of it that have gone bad, probably. Either there's a nine volt battery that's inside of it, or it's going to be a three volt um, lithium battery most of the time. Sometimes it's double A, but most of the time it's so too. Um, you take it off the wall and you replace it. It should be like the remote control um, to your TV. It should kind of look like that when you when you take it off the wall. Now, if it's not that and it's hardwired into the wall, then you should kind of, you need to replace the fixture itself. Have a great day and I hope this.